this here. Okay, I'm here. Sorry, I'm just trying to. Okay, cool. All right. Um, part of. Okay, I'm sorry, Brenda. Thank you so much, and also thank you for checking in with me earlier. Um, 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 in real time, pretty quickly. I appreciate that. Um, um, before I dive in, I want to just uh, briefly share a little bit about myself and also how I am planning to um, participate in this conversation in seven parts um, based on this slide, but also the eighth part is more or less conversational and questions and, I don't know, pushback feedback um, that you all may have. I am, um, I think this is the first time I've um, sharing um, via slide and um, bringing in so many different aspects of my work into one. Um, in terms of talking about it, although I feel like my work uh, in my person um, reflects all of these things. And so uh, this is a pretty interesting slide. I don't think I ever had a presentation that has so many slides in it, um, but it's going to move pretty quickly. Again, my name is Shana Griffin. I am a feminist activist, independent researcher, applied sociologist, artist, and mother. Um, I currently, um, since uh, I haven't changed my website, but um, in the last month, I am now I'm currently serving as the interim executive director of Antenna, um, which is a multidisciplinary arts and literary organization here in the city of New Orleans. I, again, as which was noted, I'm the founder of Punctuate and the creator of Displace, um, which I'm going to go into next. Uh, again, I'm sorry, this is in seven parts. Um, first part, quick introduction of Punctuate and Displace. I'm sorry, and then second displays. Third, we're gonna talk a little bit about New Orleans in terms of where I'm from and also its implications both for this region but also for the nation as we think about housing um, and displacement confinement rooted in slavery. And then we're gonna talk about reproductive violence and then housing um, climate and um, climate implications as it relates to housing and um, policies, uh, what I would say everyday policies of population control. Um, then we're going to come back and think about um, stereotypes that make these things possible and also um, how they manifest themselves in um, housing policies, land use planning and development. All right, y'all ready for this roller coaster? Cool. Yes. So one, um, punctuate. Um, Punctuate is a newly formed feminist research, art, and activist initiative um, based here in the city, foregrounding the embodied aesthetics and practices of Black feminists, um, thought to address intersecting forms of everyday violence and subjectivity Black women, our families, and communities experience. Um, put differently, Punctuate is an insurgent intervention, spatializing Black feminist practices through research, art, activism, and public programming. Um, the mission of Punctuate is to disrupt ideological policies and practices of control, punishment, and disposability, again, through engaged research, art, activism, and spatial imaginaries that center the epistemologies and practices of Black feminists to build socially and economically just communities. I see Punctuate as both a vision, a strategy, a practice, it's a goal, an action, and a site of resistance, possibilities, and imagined futures. Um, here, I want to situate the conversation, and this is how I think about my work and also making these connections and, 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 and thinking about connections that we don't always see, um, specifically as it relates to the violence, subjugation, and objectification of Black women bodies, reproduction, and sexuality made possible during the transatlantic slave trade and its contemporary geographic manifestations um, in land use planning, urban development, and housing policies which lie at the root of spatial, social, and cultural practices of domination and economies of Black dispossession here in the United States. From slave ships, auction blocks, plantation arrangements, and Black coals, to geographies of displacement, containment, and disposability in residential segregation, urban renewal, toxic exposure, reproductive legislation, criminalization, and cultural control. Black women, our families, and communities are daily negotiating and challenging geographic spaces and places that uphold legacies of slavery and social policies designed to make us disappear. The sexual and reproductive lives of Black women, particularly low-income women, are situated between ideological frameworks that um, seek to control our sexuality and reproduction, as well as discriminatory housing policies and development practices that disproportionately restrict, displace, and regulate our movement and life chances coupled with policies of disgust and blame 
that uses stereotypes, fear, and politically motivated misperceptions to criminalize um, our families and communities. It is within this site that my work on displace, on a displaced project, my housing advocacy, and climate activism take shape and occupy space, serving as a point of disruption, interaction, and possibilities. Two, um, with regards to the displaced project, um, a displaced is a, I'm sorry, what's next here? Okay, displaced is a multimedia feminist and public history project um, that traces the geographies of black displacement, dislocation, confinement, and disposability in land use planning and urban development here in New Orleans beginning with the formation of the city and its cartographies of violence and racial slavery and, and, and indigenous genocide, this place illustrates historical and contemporary forms of property-led development and a property value of white social identity through policies of divestment, social exclusion, and a privatization of public resources. As a project, this place interrogates critical research methods and activism within socially engaged art to raise awareness on the multiple ways the violence of displacement is manifested and explores how housing policies, both federal and local, become sites of everyday violence, subjectivity, as well as resistance and possibilities. Here, this project asks, and I ask lots of questions. I don't feel like there's always answers, but I think it's always important to move with inquiry. Uh, this place asks, what is our understanding of displacement? and displacements with an S, um, and thinking about how displacement takes more than one form. How is displacement um, and gentrification, is related to gentrification, or is displacement and gentrification the same thing? They're often used interchangeably, and I often, rarely in my work reference, I mean, I talk about gentrification, but it's not the primary entry point. I'm more inclined to talk about displacement and this and gentrification as one example of many. How is displacement um, connected to climate-induced migration and war, disease, um, economic conditionality policies, environmental racism? What is displacement relationship to art making, to race, to gender? How do we challenge hidden and explicit forms of racial, sexual, and reproductive violence in housing policies, land use planning, urban development? Um, I don't need to go through all of these questions. I, um, but just definitely want you all to think deeply about them. Um, this is how I think about um, displacement all the time and also how do I push the boundaries of what we think we know and what we're trying to work against. Next, we're gonna move into New Orleans. Um, typically when people think of the city, they think of images like this or this and this, all referencing Hurricane Katrina. Or they think about images like this, the fleur de lis, or Mardi Gras, the food, um, black um, and indigenous, uh, black, I'm sorry, black associated pleasure clubs and black masking or Mardi Gras Indian traditions. Rarely do we think about images like this. Here I am intentionally bringing our attention um, to this uh, image, um, intentionally want us to think deeply about the role that New Orleans played in becoming the largest slave trade in port um, here in the US and what some historians will refer to as the largest slave trade in port in North America um, between the 18, um, I would say starting, but starting in 1808 up into um, the Civil War. Um, as many as you know, New Orleans initially was a French colony and then a Spanish and then a French and then a American um, purchased by um, America from France um, in 1803, doubling the size of the country. And the Louisiana Purchase was so large, it comprised what we think of today as, uh, in, I'm sorry, it comprises 13 states today and two Canadian uh, um, uh, provinces. Um, New Orleans, uh, and I don't know if I have this map. No, I don't, it's maybe later. Um, but here, I just really wanna think about both New Orleans as a site of racialized violence um, through racial slavery, as well as the role that the city played in um, positioning the United States become a, to become a global economic empire, starting in 1808 after the country abolished the international slave trade, which created greater demand for domestic the domestic slave trade, whereby over 2 million people uh, were bought and sold 
primarily processed through the city of New Orleans, um, sold in the deep south, which is why New Orleans was also one of the strategic um, site of uh, repossession by the Union Army um, to stop the flow and trade of slavery through the Mississippi River. I'm bringing our attention here as Clyde Woods and Catherine McKidrick's notes in Black Geographies, the politics of place um, and how space is occupied by the colonized, enslaved, incarcerated, and the dispossessed. So when I'm thinking about and talking about displacement, I'm also asking that we acknowledge and interrogate the historical and contemporary, contemporary forms in which displacement takes place. And so much of my work, I start with slavery and any conversation around displacement. Four. Here, um, the Displaced Project started actually through my work around reproductive violence. Um, and I was really interested in looking at how reproductive violence manifests itself in housing policies. Um, it doesn't just occur in housing policy, um, and we'll get to that slide where I outline what I found. But here, I want us to strategically look at these correlations. This is a chart that I created several um, years ago, and recently, this year, I included, finally, I did it before and lost a file, included a column on housing policies. I want us to think deeply, um, here's my little cheat sheet here, um, about what you all are looking at. I am intentionally, uh, putting side by side US housing policies coupled with our political economy and what is our reproductive policy during these different time periods and how does that look as it relates to housing and also the state response. Let me readjust the view here. Sorry. Um, here, when we think about um, the US policy period of colonialism, we can see that reproductive policy was genocidal and the housing policy is centered around settler colonialism and our state response is extermination. When we look at slavery, we see similar um, patterns where we have slavery as the dominant policy period. The reproductive policy is exploitative, again, about the control, and the control of the reproduction of um, I'm sorry, controlling the reproduction of black bodies for the production of profit and to build empire. Um, the housing policy is centered around plantation arrangements and residential confined compounds. The state's response is paternalistic. Um, next, I wanna really go deep on immigration and legislation and then come to neoliberalism um, and also maybe the Great Society. I'm not gonna discuss all of them, but just wanna point out a few things. When we think about immigration legislation, this is that time period when we see some of the most um, racist um, immigration policies of the United States also during uh, the eugenics era, but it's also coupled with the New Deal. And most of what we think about housing policies, especially contemporary housing policies are all rooted in the New Deal era. When we think about the Housing Act of 1933, um, that led to the formation of the Home Owners Loan Corporation Housing Act of 1934 with regards to the Federal Housing Administration and the Housing Act of 1937 that led to the creation of the house, U.S. Housing Authority and also the development of public housing across the country. New Orleans being one of the first um, pilot cities um, to enact funding, uh, to utilize funding um, from the Housing Act of 1937. Um, where President Roosevelt signed off. The first application was came from the city of New Orleans um, because we had a housing authority already set up. Um, <laughs> um, I don't wanna get into that story, but that's, that's it. But again, thinking about eugenics and the New Deal, but also coupled with um, the contradictions of New Deal housing policies, because this is where we see um, at the root of um, racial residential segregation, exclusion and slum clearance is taking place. The state response is about separatist, separation and exclusion. We also see these contradictions with the great society during the post-civil rights era as well. What a reproductive policy is controlling and in terms of housing, this is where we see urban renewal, predatory inclusion taking place. Again, the state response is about reform and um, to pathologize. We see these similarities also when we think about welfare reform and also neoliberal austerity measures in terms of where we are today. I don't have dates listed on this chart, although it is a timeline, but I wanna emphasize that um, during each policy period, it doesn't mean that one thing went away and the other came online. It just shows that one is not, one thing is becoming more dominant um, as opposed to um, the other one cease to exist. So these things are all happening simultaneously, but one is the most dominant. 
um, if that makes sense in terms of um, how we're thinking about this. Sorry. Um, here, I want to bring our attention to a quote. Um, this is from a housing activist in um, 2007. The Housing Authority of New Orleans and HUD had to appeal to the City of New Orleans City Council to get permits to, um, they needed permits to uh, approval, I'm sorry, approval from the City Council to um, demolish four, I mean, five public housing developments. At the city council hearing, Ms. Sharon Jasper, a former public housing resident and housing advocate states, um, I am sick and tired of being disrespected. I'm a black woman. If I have to go to jail, if I have to die for what I believe in, I will not be treated like a slave. I'm a human being, a United States citizen. Here, I want us to um, bring your attention to this. Um, you know, based off the previous slide about um, reproductive violence and housing policies, um, in the city post Hurricane Katrina, um, many neighborhoods were participating in a um, planning process, identifying ways in which higher neighborhoods would be redeveloped or come back online. Public housing residents are, I should say, um, public housing neighborhoods are residents who lived in public housing neighborhoods would not afford it the same right and opportunity. Here, Ms. Jasper is associating um, disrespect, what it, she's connecting what it means to be a black woman is tied to being disrespected. She's also referring historical moment when black people did go to jail, uh, when they fought for what they believed in. Um, also challenging this idea that she would not be a slave when in fact uh, um, her ancestry, um, collectively our ancestry was tied to being a slave, what it means to be um, capital in this country. She also states I'm a human being, a United States citizen. Here you can see this hierarchy in her comments to show that she, what it means to be a human is above, I mean, I'm sorry, what it means to be a United States citizen is above what it means to be human. Yet to be human in this country as a black woman is to be disrespected. Um, and so here is just, I'm, I'm using this quote to show the contradictions of democracy and what does it mean when who's afforded a right to participate in how their neighborhoods are gonna be redeveloped. Unfortunately, on this date, on December 20th in 2007, the city council approved the permits requested by HUD and the local housing authority to demolish public housing. Five. So again, when we think about the political economy, the political economy of reproductive violence and housing policies and how that equates with cartographies of violence and black displacement. This is the map that I thought was I had earlier, but this is a map of the city of New Orleans in 1849. You see these red dots. The red dots on the map reflects Google pinpoints. Unlike most places in the South um, where you had a town center where auction, they had an auction block where people was bought and sold. In the city of New Orleans, there were several places where people was purchased, um, I'm sorry, sold and purchased into slavery. Um, here, if you can see my curse, I'm gonna point out a few things. Well, we have municipality, one, two, three, and four. This is the historic French quarter of the city. You see all of these red dots. Here along this red, yellow slime, you see another cluster of, uh, of red dots. This is a neighborhood, um, the Fogberg, um, what is this, uh, Marigny neighborhood, along with Espinade Avenue. And here, you see this larger cluster right here on the um, left, I guess the left side of this green red dot being red line. This is um, what we will refer to today as the central business district. This was the finance district of the city. It is this particular area where you could literally trace um, the financial capital of the United States through slavery on the city of New Orleans. Uh, where you could see where people in cotton was bought and sold, cotton that was brought to Liverpool um, in the UK um, for the development of industries there, what we know now in terms of thinking about the Industrial Revolution. So you can see this trajectory from slavery to the Industrial Revolution and the role that the city played in building this empire. Um, unlike most places, like I stated, where you had a town center, people was bought and sold in private homes, at slave pens, at auction blocks, at hotels, at public schools, at markets, on the street, um, on a ship, um, in churches. Um, it didn't matter. It was, it was all about making money. Here, I'm sorry, I should state this is what I'm referring to. This section is thinking about cartographies of violence. I'm going to go through a few maps. 
Here, this is a map of this country when you can, this is um, from the 1900s. Um, and this is reflecting the concentration of black residents um, of the black population of the country, which you can see is primarily uh, rooted in the South. Here, this is a, I have this twice um, emphasizing, but this again, this is from the US Housing Authority. These are propaganda posters. Uh, one is slum breeds crime and the other cross out slums. With the slum breeding crime, again, going back to the correlation and relationship between reproductive violence and housing policies, this idea that people are reproducing criminals. Um, this other one I find is really interesting with the cross out slums. It reminds me of the visible hand of capital. You know, like they said, idea about, we think about capitalism and the invisible hand of the state. Um, but again, marking out in terms of who has the right to exist or to live in a particular neighborhood. Again, this one reminds me of just a map of, uh, I'm sorry, a poster of disposability, marking out who can come in and who cannot. This is a redlining map of New Orleans. Um, you know, since the 1970s, um, the red line maps have become um, more accessible to the general public. Most people um, during the period in which um, these, the homeowners, loan corporation, residential, um, residential security maps um, were not known. Very few people saw them. Um, but here you can see um, this map from 1939 in the city, the vast majority of New Orleans, not one particular neighborhood or certain district, um, but the vast majority of the city is red line even the entire French Quarter. Um, you can also see the yellow. And so you can see 85%, I'm sorry, probably 90% of the city was not deemed worthy of investment. Um, this is a map um, of the city um, in terms of their reference proposed for slum clearance and urban redevelopment. Um, and there are a few maps in the city where you actually see this listed on there. And I just wanted to just, I think this map is pretty interesting, especially when we think about development and urban um, planning and land use use. Um, this is a map um, with uh, Hurricane Katrina. This was actually done by the New York Times, is dated September 23rd. You can see that uh, it's a map of where people were displaced to. Um, during this time, over 1.5 million people were displaced from the Gulf Coast area, and you can see the displacement is still primarily concentrated in the south. It almost mirrors the map from the, eight, the 1900s that I previously showed you all. Um, this is a, uh, not a map, but a chart of the public housing sites um, and available units here in the city. Here I'm using one of um, bring your attention to the ways in which displacement takes place as it relates to erasure. Um, you can see here the original names of developments, St. Thomas, now it's called River Gardens. Um, the Arborville Public Housing Development, actually this is a development that I grew up in, or was, uh, came online in 1941 and it was um, constructed um, as a segregated development for white residents. Um, its name has changed from Arborville to Benville. What is interesting I want <laughs> to bring to y'all attention is Aberville uh, was a French um, Canadian colonizer um, known as the governor of Louisiana and his brother Bienville um, was the founder of the city of New Orleans. And so when we think about monuments, um, what does it mean? Um, you don't have to have a statue for the monuments to still exist and reign over a city. Well, you have this uh, development now called Bienville Basin, which is a, a mixed um, mixed income um, development now, and I'll get to that. But here, when you think about the total number of units and all of these developments from um, historically what they were, what they are today, and how many of the current units are available for um, low-income residents, you can see this constant shrinkage. And you also can see it begs the questions, where are these people live, living today? Here, again, going back to that red line map, um, I, I was able to um, participate in some research and write a report in collaboration with staff at Jane Place Neighborhood Sustainability Development, the first community land trust in the city that I co-founded 13 years ago, along with Davida Fanger, a, a, a public interest uh, attorney um, and a professor at Loyola Law Clinic, Law, I'm sorry, Loyola Law School. Um, we created these maps based off this report and we document the eviction um, evictions here in the city. And you can see the eviction geography of the city mirrors the redlining geography of the city. And so this legacy is so ingrained where you, we overlay 
the red line maps on top of the eviction map. Y'all see that? I don't see any heads nodding, so I just wanna make sure. Okay, thanks. All right, in six, this is where I'm gonna try to move quick um, in terms of population control and reproductive violence in terms of how it looks in our everyday life. Here, uh, I don't know, back in 2007, I came up with this concept called population control policies of everyday life. Normally when we think about population control, we think about China and this one um, child rule, which is no longer the case anymore, but we don't think about ways in which we can control populations through blame or social neglect, abandonment and divestment or displacement or disenfranchisement and assimilation and others. Normally we often think about um, population control primarily as it relates to um, experimentation or sterilization. Here I'm getting us to see beyond just that narrow frame. I wanna bring our attention here specifically to assimilation as a form of population control. When we think about housing policies, especially with regards to public housing, the goal is always to deconcentrate poverty and push for mixed income development. This idea of mixed income development is fraught and it's also a strategy around assimilation. This idea that we will put poor people to middle income people and hopefully someday at some point, these poor income, um, low income residents will learn how to become good citizens um, and adopt middle class values. Um, this idea is a, it's a, totally an assimilation strategy. Um, we see assimilation also as it relates to immigration as also when we think about queer communities uh, where people are expected to behave in these heterosexual ways, um, sometimes of which out of safety, but also to be seen as real and human and deserving of resources and rights. Um, population control policies are reinforced through controlling images, stereotypes, fear, scarcity tactics, criminalization, policing, myths. This all sounds like our current president, right? Um, here, through my research on, re on reproductive violence um, and population control practices, I, I see reproductive violence existing within sexual and reproductive health, which is seen clear. We also, I also see it in climate change policies and environmental policies, as well as welfare and also corrections and public safety. But for the purposes of this conversation, I'm focused on housing and land use, and I should say climate, because normally we think about climate and there are many people who believe that one of the strategies, if not the only strategy to solving a climate crisis is to reduce the population. And normally that is often racialized. Here, these are some correlations, some images I just wanna walk us through. This is an old image from the um, late nineties. Um, this idea that family, again, listen to this, family planning changes everything. So you go from this, we don't know what this image is or what caused this, or even if it's real, but this idea that you're pairing the two together from this green pristine environment where we don't want certain bodies or certain people to destroy. But this idea that we got go from here to here is because of family planning. This is another image. Um, again, we have no idea what is going on here, but it states what this place needs is more condoms. This is a big leap. We don't know if the uh, fertility rates have anything to do with what is going on with this desert-like environment here. But again, this is part of um, what we call the greening of hate and reproductive justice circles. Um, this is another map where you look at, it's called population pressures, threat to democracy. Again, this idea that populations is a threat um, um, as it relates to, and you can see here the US, we have this one point and you have throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Southeast Asia, um, and also throughout South America and Central America, um, which is very racist. Um, and also what is interesting is that the, when we think about environmental footprints, the environmental footprint of the US and European countries is much far higher than those of in places in um, Sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. Even though you may have higher fertility rates in Africa, um, the environmental footprint is much low. So there's a false correlation between um, fertility rates and environmental impacts. So if it was the case, if there was a real true correlation, then we will be sterilizing most people in the United States and in Europe, um, but that's not the case. Again, going back to that propaganda posters from the United States Housing Authority, again, these correlations. Um, this is a quote from um, the William Bennett, former Secretary of State of Education in 2005. He makes this comment, um, what is this? A month, uh, a month and a half after Hurricane Katrina, but this idea that if you want to reduce crime, you could, 
um, if that was your sole purpose, you can abort every black, um, I'm sorry, I can't see the full screen here, let's see. Every black baby in this country and your crime rate would go down. Um, again, this is going back to mirroring this image here, this idea that crime, you know, um, slums breed crime are here, he's just been explicit as if black people are the source of criminality in the country, which also have major impacts on our um, housing policies um, and land use planning. This is the secretary, former secretary of HUD um, after Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, when more than 80% of public housing residents, uh, I'm sorry, more than 80% of public housing residents in the city were black women. He's making these statements that the city is not going to be black again, if ever. Um, and this is when he was um, proposing that um, seeking um, approval from the city council to demolish public housing. Um, so yeah, interesting. I'm sorry, and it also happened. This also is a, a former um, Louisiana representative who proposed legislation that um, maybe the state should pay poor people $1,000 to be sterilized. This happened during in um, 2008, um, at the time in which um, the Bush administration was bailing out Wall Street. Again, placing the blame on low-income people as opposed to really looking at um, the true uh, uh, criminals when you think about corporate welfare in terms of what's causing problems in our country. Again, population control policies of everyday life are reinforced through controlling images, stereotypes, fears, scarcity tactics, criminalization, policing, and myths. This is what occurred, just to reinforce this. And seven, just wanna share with you some relation, correlation between gender, race, and housing and climate. Um, one of the things that we don't talk about in housing work is that housing is a very, very gender issue. We normally think about it as just racial or we think about it as it relates to class. You know, when we think about fair housing, we often think about race, but fair housing includes multiple class of people, not just race. When we think about um, low income um, housing or affordable housing, we're thinking about class, but rarely do we acknowledge the fact that the vast majority of people who utilize public housing or uh, housing subsidies are low income women or look at the gender racial disparities um, when we think about the high the the housing crisis from 2000 I'm um, sorry from 12 years ago starting in 2007 and 8 or the overrepresentation of black women in eviction proceedings you know women and queer people's elevated vulnerability to poverty and violence when they're trying to access housing um, so here again I want us to really think deeply about housing as a gender issue not just race not just class but if you're talking about race and class you're talking about gender there's no way to get around it Stereotypes, these are just some quotes I wanted to share um, that again, in, and it may feel like it's just from individuals, but it definitely resonates and it informs how, uh, informs our, um, how we are developing um, communities and cities and our um, recommendations and plans. Here, housing units discuss had, you know, this is from, I'm sorry, I should just give you all more context. This is from a comment from a, a article about saving public housing in the city. Um, again, you see this person is going from housing to population. Um, yeah. And here, this is from um, another comment. Again, referring to the reproductive capabilities of Black women as um, litters of pups. Um, there's milk in the system. All right, so public disposability over here, up here. Again, I just, this is a funny, I don't know if I would like this anymore, but choice and blame is the name of the game. Again, we're thinking about the public who occupies the public, who is seen as the public. And this is where we see a lot of targeted control and also a lot of stereotypes that are used. And this is where we see also a lot of violence um, and discrimination and exclusion, both as it relates to public housing, public education and public health care. Um, and also post Hurricane Katrina, we saw a complete um, demolition of public housing, the dismantling of our public health care system, and a neoliberal takeover of public education. It's almost as if anything that's public is deemed bad and needs to be controlled. So I will stop there and um, go really quickly to bring it back to the front. Are there any questions in terms of these? Interrogations and connections between social policies and the violence of disposability. Wow. 
I'm sure there are a lot of questions, um, but, but I just wanted to say that to thank you so much for, for this intervention. And I think it comes at exactly the right time um, in our series as a way to connect the dots and to remember how to really understand how racism and whiteness underpin everyday housing policies. We need to start with the history and we need to broaden out and understand the big lenses, how this has been framed. I remember as we were speaking, um, the first in our kind of in, internal lab chat, I was open to alums as well in July after the faculty letter in our program on um, questioning whiteness in, in our disciplines. Our first, we tried to make a ways that will work better as a lab. And our first order of operations was don't dance around race. And I think um, as you spoke, I've remembered so many I'm not sure if I can call them micro comments, but ways that people have talked about housing and units and um, oh, those are just for those big families, you know, the people who can't stop, meaning black women having lots of children mean, in, in the stereotypes and the racialized assumptions that came with them. And um, it's easier not to remember that. It's easier not to engage with the tangle, the way these housing is tangled um, with that. So I think um, Another thing that, that brought up to me is how we've at the lab have been thinking a lot about housing that matches the heterogeneity of family types and of units without judgment and really to untangle and unpack that means to engage explicitly with the history of housing, not only as like a civilizing device for the poor people, but as a racial um, device and part of that narrative. So um, well, I'm taking from you, this is just a comment that we're going to try to do better and not dancing around things. Um, and thank you for providing the lenses on how to connect the dots that we've been that we've been that we've been um, listening with over the semester. I guess um, I one of I have some questions kind of looking forward in in, in some ways a political question. You know, um, Kamala and, and Harris and Joe Biden said you know we know that that black women have had our back and we're going to, to do something. Is this just, you know, tokenism? What might, what what would be the ideal scenario for housing policy if there were to be something big, bold, and ambitious that acknowledged um, both the uh, kind of the, the critical role that black women played in this election um, and also um, the, the intertwining and problematic ways that housing is engaged with that. But don't answer that. Other people have better questions, I am sure. And so we'll turn turn to open the floor. Um, I know uh, Juan and Jenna had, had interjections. Um, Joanne has been thinking about this session um, along with me over the last week. So um, anyone? Um, yeah, I, I can start with the question. I, I very much like the way you framed the historical nature of these processes as uh, translation transnational links that started with the transatlantic uh, slave traffic and trying to uh, flip that idea um, to what extent forms of emplacement of, of uh, these people and communities reclaiming a sense of uh, of place and fighting against uh, dispossession and displacement have been uh, thought in a similar way in 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 a network more than in a localized struggle or a, or fighting against a specific threat of of displacement. I'm sorry, just to make sure I understand your question, you're asking me what are some ways in which people are engaging on displacement? Um, I don't know if you used the word movements, um, but in different, I'm sorry, if you don't mind, I just want to make sure I got, I captured it correctly. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, because of course we know a lot of uh, grassroots activism that's happening in public housing, in, uh, fighting for expanding affordability um, but to what extent that is also uh, considered or organized as a network as a way to answer how this 
the, the fact that many of these issues came as networks of overlying over overlying oppressions if that makes sense mm -hmm. okay i think i got it so one thing uh, um just to clarify and i didn't stress this on uh, my comments is that when and that when i think about displacement i'm thinking about in order to displace a community you have to just you or you are um confining them or containing them in one area or disposing them in another right uh, so when we think about how we're moving people around and two is thinking about um thank you we have to go back and look at the historical narrative of why how some things came into existence otherwise when we are organizing um or engaging in advocacy work we might find ourselves advocating for something that we will otherwise um advocating for something that we will otherwise be against and so i think in terms of your direct question we have to think deeply about multiple strategies when i think about my work i think about there's the research there's the activism, there's the art, there's also the building of community and also reimagining what the community, the types of institutions that are needed. And so I can't talk about what I'm talking about without also acknowledging that I've been in the trenches doing the work, both as it relates to public housing advocacy, but also starting the first community land trust here in the city. And what does it mean to um, bring housing units online while also understanding that the units that I'm able to bring online exist within a system that is not supportive of tenants. And so the idea of affordable housing loses its meaning in the city of New Orleans and the state of Louisiana when our tenant right laws that was established in 1825 have not changed much in the last 200 years and is all very pro landlord. So as such, given those constraints, I can legally you know, develop housing and still put someone out. Is that the best strategy? To me, I would take an abolitionist approach and make sure that I, as I am developing, um, building, you know, affordable units, I am also making sure that the tenant rights, the leases reflect not what the law mandates, but what the law should be. So I'm not going to wait for the state to change its tenant right laws. I'm going to make sure that we are working together with other members of the staff or members of the non uh, the community land trust to make sure the leases are very pro tenant and reflect what the law should be, not what it is. And so we have to also be committed to working um, on more than one front um, or working in collaboration with others because you can't do everything, but recognizing you don't limit yourself to what you can do, but also think about what it should, what it should look like and move from that angle, if that makes sense. There's some examples of modifications to the leases, and that's such a great idea. Um, yeah. So in the city, um, again, like I said, like you know, even when we think of New Orleans has a major eviction crisis going on, both as it relates to the pandemic but pre-pandemic. Um, and um, you know, in this report, we note that the residential lease laws in the state of Louisiana, the root of New Orleans problem, problems lie at the state where the lease loss was created in 1825. 1825, what was going on? New Orleans was the largest slave trading port in the country. And so it was about property owners, right? And so to me, what that lease means that um, I can make the housing affordable um, based on subsidies that we have or may not have. I can think about what is a um, renting with equity looks like, thinking about an equity model that's not based on rent to own, but where renters can gain equity at the same time. Um, as they're renting the way homeowners gain equity um, through their relationship with their bank. Um, and two, because um, in the city, um, most people are evicted for non-payment of rent and that non-payment of rent is primarily could be one month late. Um, so with the lease, we can give people, we can work out an agreement where people have more time to cure. Also assist people um, with thinking about a payment plan if they're too far behind. Um, the other um, is um, making sure that the units are affordable for the family, and if not, supporting them and locating somewhere else where they can afford, but definitely making sure, exhaust every possibility before um, we go to, um, you know, eviction court. And I want to be very clear, this is something I helped create. I am no longer on the board member of JPNSI. Um, but help institutionalize these policies around our lease to make it very pro-landlord, I mean, I'm sorry, pro-tenant, 
um, whereby even though it's a nonprofit, uh, we benefit in ways that tenants don't in terms of the lease arrangement. So thinking about what is a renting partnership really looks like. Um, and so residents have a time to more time to correct. Um, we, there won't be an automatic um, eviction filing. Um, they will receive their security deposit. But again, the goal is to keep families in their homes um, and exalt every possibility before an eviction, before even getting to eviction, as opposed to you don't pay, then the next thing is evict, right? Um, just sit down and see, and again, not disclosing all your personal information, but see what's going on and how can we rectify the situation and give the tenants an opportunity to cure. And if not, if they're behind, thinking about a payment plan and also creating in, uh, incentivized tenants to pay. Um, and that's through that um, equity model. That's really fascinating. I'd love to see some examples of that or how we could promote it and, you know, or circulate it more widely at the lab. With JP and I to see if um, they would be cool with sharing the lease. I'm sure everyone would. Um, it was a lot of work working with different um, sure. uh, housing attorneys and thinking about, you know, what things, what the law should be and not wait, but start to, again, start that process now. Yeah, that's so interesting. That echoes what um, uh, Deidre Schmidt, a big developer of great affordable housing in Minnesota, said. You know, we can't, we have to lead with good developments and good housing that have regulations inside of them and not wait on the law. And so, one, I was really intrigued by the map that you had on overlaying evictions and redlining. And uh, we have uh, Wenfei Xu on the call who, who actually uh, mapped out redlining as well. So, it'd be interesting to see or to learn where you guys figured that out in that intersection. But I know that there were other questions. Um, Jenna, um, Joanne had one, but I think she's dropped off the call. She had some connection issues as well. So, or any other questions or thoughts? Jenna, how do you think, or how does this connect to the displacement um, conversation of a few weeks ago with Sandstein? I was thinking about how in general, honestly, that our planning and architecture cur curriculums do are trying to pivot to be more radical and acknowledge and untangle whiteness, but honestly do it in a really piecemeal way and never start with the big picture and what you laid out is kind of how it could happen, that initial framing. Um, but similarly, I, and I don't know the displacement literature, I think it's often those big connections are missing in the kind of epistemologies of how we understand and talk about epistemologies. I'm not sure if I'm using it right, but the history of how we talk about what we talk about and they're still pretty narrow um at least in my the way I, i've experienced my education here yeah i agree and uh, shane i appreciated your point earlier about how kind of the concepts of gentrification and displacement can um we can sometimes use them interchangeably even though i think like analytically they are pretty different um and sort of just as there is kind of like overarching trend to sort of complete the two. But my understanding, at least from just like the literature that I've read about it, is that um, there's kind of an evolving understanding over time of kind of like what are the primary actors that are driving displacement. So like thinking back to the 1950s and 1960s when there are these big urban renewal projects, it seems like a lot of times people kind of conceptualize displacement as being driven by these like large public actions and government institutions. Um, but then like as even today, like I guess the back to city movement is kind of, um, I guess thinking more about how individual preferences are driving displacement, but also how that's linked up with like state-led gentrification and sort of the like global circuits of capital that are investing in international real estate. Um, so I guess in my mind, that's kind of how I disentangled um, kind of displacement and gentrification. But um, yeah, I thought that's a, a really good point that you mentioned earlier. Um, sorry, I was looking for a slide, but it would take me too long. Yes, and one thing I just, again, thinking about displacement, when we think about economic displacement, there's residential, there's social, 
displacement as it relates to erasure, like if you can change the name of a community, you're literally rewriting the story and assuming that you can literally er erase people um, through narratives um, as if they never even existed. Also, when we think about displacement, again, we think primarily as it relates to urban. We don't think about war as a form of displacement. We don't think about environmental toxicity as a form of displacement or conflict. Um, we normally think about conflict on a like, global scale. We don't think about it um, in the US um, as a form. Also, we don't think about evictions as a form of displacement or um, uh, what do you call it, neglect by design. When we think about public housing and the failure of the US government to invest in maintaining the buildings. And over time, after five years, 10 years, 20 years later, you can justify whole scale demolition of those units. And that's a form of displacement whereby those communities are not being necessarily displaced because they're being gentrified. And then even when we think about gentrification, we have to recognize it's also about uh, real estate taxes and property. And most cities receive at least 25% uh, to a third of their revenue from property taxes. So when we think about it, with most municipalities, there is no incentive to stop or put the brakes on neighborhoods and communities being gentrified because it's about dollars and cents, right? Some people will encourage neighborhoods to be um, gentrified. So you could displace a community without gentrifying. The map I showed with Hurricane Katrina um, and how communities like 1.5 million people was displaced, that had nothing to do with gentrification, right? Um, but the environmental disaster, the climate induced disaster um, caused that whole scale displacement. And so we, to, it's, to me, it's really important that we think deeply about various forms of displacement and how it takes place, but also how it's interconnect with our residential um, urban development strategy. I mean, rural, I would just say not just urban, I'm focused primarily on urban, but thinking about our land use policies um, and housing policies, right? Like how displacement, um, and even like we think about transportation system, even like all, kind, like all of the cool funky things that we really want can also reinforce the displacement that's taken place. Last thing I would just emphasize, post Hurricane Katrina, I, uh, my partner at the time, we were participating in our neighborhood association, I'm not sorry, neighborhood organization meeting about how our neighborhood would be, you know, redeveloped and brought back online. And I found myself in this situation where everything that I truly, truly wanted for my neighborhood, I found myself actually voting against. Cause I was like, if I get those things, I will literally be planning myself out of my neighborhood. I wouldn't be able to afford to live in it. And so I think it's also important that we critique these ideas about um, what, you know, going from this big dream, what do you want, as opposed to thinking about the wealth that already exists. And so we think about like sitcoms like Good Times and the Jeffersons, it was all about moving on up, moving out of the neighborhoods. Well, I feel like community land trust offers opportunities for us to build wealth within and not wait for funds to just come in, but how are we building and re-engaging and reimagining what strategies of development can look like that's democratic, just, um, that pushes back against displacement. Well, we're approaching uh, in New York street noise, <laughs> but, um, approaching the hour, but I just wanted to, and thank you so incredibly much for um, your thoughts and presentation today. If I could ask one last closing comment, what are you, what's next? You are such a, I don't know, an entrepreneur of ideas and initiatives and thoughts and provocation. Where, um, what's your next tiny thing on your list that you're going to do or um, the next map that you want to make? <laughs> oh, I thought about making a futuristic map. Um, but right now I'm focused on um, a lot of research and creating a public, um, public pro historical project on black women in public housing. And in terms of the displaced project, I am working out, wrapping up the timeline um, that starts with to be, you know, 18, I'm sorry, 1680s up into the current, uh, creating an interactive timeline and also an atlas of displacement, combining different key ideas that we would normally put together and mapping that out and then exploring what the possibilities of an exhibition of the displaced project can look like. Thank you so much again, um, and we'll be in touch as a team and as a lab and um, and ask for your ideas down the road. Absolutely, and if um, folks are interested in the 
very long slide. Just let me know. No, those those were incredible. Um, so we appreciate them. And and again, if anyone has any questions about this session being recorded or being shared publicly, um, reach out to me or GSAP Housing Lab at Columbia.edu. Thank you again, Shana, um, for the wonderful presentation and everyone who's joined us this afternoon. And our next um, Housing Lab conversation will be on December um, 11th or December 4th to be determined, but we'll, we're gonna try to talk about the products that we can take out from the semester and ways to share and publicize them. So we might, we might reach back out to you for your ideas. I think um, by far, this has been one of the most creative and wide reaching ones of the semester. So thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.